Sometimes, great events happen in small places. This is certainly true of the life of Jesus Christ. The events described in the four Gospels happened in quite a small area. His birth in Bethlehem, his temptation in the desert of Judea, his ministry around the Lake of Galilee, and his death and resurrection at Jerusalem. But let's go back about 2,000 years to the time of Christ. The four Gospels tell us about the life of Jesus, his miracles of healing, and his teaching about the kingdom of God. But they're not just biographies. The word gospel means good news. Miracles of healing were good news for the people who experienced them. But this good news is a lot more than that. Something has happened that is important. It's important to us, and it's good news. The first book of good news in the New Testament is Matthew. The book itself does not actually say who wrote it, but it's always been called the Gospel of Matthew. According to Papias, a bishop in the early second century, the Apostle Matthew listened to the words of Jesus and wrote them down. Who better to keep a written record of what Jesus said than someone who was a tax collector before he became a disciple? For Matthew, the most important thing is that in the person of Jesus, the kingdom of God has come to us. Jesus is the king, promised by God in the Jewish scriptures we call the Old Testament. It means that the Gospel of Matthew is written from a strongly Jewish perspective. But his vision of this kingdom of God reaches out not just to Jewish people, but to all people everywhere. The kingdom does not come without cost. Deep personal cost, both to Jesus and to all who follow him. But it's worth it. Over and over it's worth it. Let's start with the first link Matthew makes with the Old Testament. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. A record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah. You see what Matthew's doing? He's reaching right back into the Old Testament. Abraham was a man of great faith. Two thousand years before Christ, God had promised that through his seed, all nations on earth should be blessed. And so it goes on with the line of inheritance from father to son. But five times, Matthew gives us the names of women, and two of them were from other nations. One of them is Rahab in the city of Jericho. She was a Canaanite, belonging to a people who were idolaters. But she decided she would turn to God and trust in him, even if it meant taking enormous risks. Rahab found a new home among God's people. She married, and her son was Boaz of Bethlehem in the tribe of Judah. Another woman is Ruth, the mother of Obed. She was a Moabite, an immigrant who came to Bethlehem trying to help her mother-in-law. Both as a foreigner and a widow, she faced a difficult situation. But she married Boaz of Bethlehem, and her great-grandson was King David. So even here, at the beginning, is the kingdom reaching out to include other nations. The line continues through David and Solomon and the kings of Judah of many generations until it comes to Joseph. The physical ancestry of Jesus was only from Mary, but his inheritance came through his adoptive father, Joseph. For Matthew, 
This is a link with salvation history and the promises of God. Open Matthew chapter 2 and you'll see another connection with the Old Testament. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, near Jerusalem. Today, Bethlehem is a town. 2,000 years ago, it was just a small village, perhaps no more than about 300 people. Even then, it was well known, because a thousand years before Christ, David had come from Bethlehem, and God had made him king. So Bethlehem is a connection between Jewish history and Jesus. But the king in Jerusalem, when Jesus was born, was Herod, and he had no connection at all with the royal house of David. Matthew chapter 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi, wise men from the east, came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. The answer was in the Old Testament. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they told him, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people, Israel. In the eyes of the people, Herod was not a legitimate Jewish king. His power depended on the approval of the Roman emperor, his own political skills, and his army, which included mercenary soldiers. Herod called the wise men secretly, the city was already buzzing with rumours, and the king knew he must act quickly. First, he questioned the wise men about what they had seen. When precisely had the star appeared? How old was this child likely to be? Again, Herod got the information he wanted. Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. The distance from Jerusalem to Bethlehem was not far. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped. Then they opened their treasures and offered their gifts. Gold for a king, incense for worship and for a priest to offer to God, myrrh as the balm of one who would heal the sick. The wise men had come from the east, from the lands of the Gentiles. Matthew shows that Christ is king, prophesied in the Jewish scriptures, and attracts his followers from all nations. When Herod realized that the wise men would not return, he told his soldiers to kill all boys in Bethlehem, two years old and under. Matthew sees a fulfillment of the Old Testament prophet Jeremiah. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. The theme of suffering has come in. Warned by God, Joseph had taken the child and his mother during the night. Herod had failed to destroy Jesus Christ. Jesus was saved from Herod's massacre by being taken into Egypt. Again, Matthew crosses the border to the Gentiles, as North Africa provides a safe place until Herod is dead. After the death of King Herod, the way was now open for Joseph to take Jesus back to the land of his birth. 
Again, Matthew makes a connection with the Old Testament. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. Matthew is quoting from Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. But in fact, this was not a prophecy about the future. It was a statement referring back to the Exodus. The whole of salvation history, including the Exodus from Egypt, found its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. So, like his ancestors at the time of Moses, Jesus made his way from Egypt to the Promised Land. Open Matthew chapter 4, and about 30 years have gone by. Jesus goes into the desert for a time of fasting and spiritual preparation. The wilderness of Judea, to the east of Jerusalem, down to Jericho and the Dead Sea, is a desolate area. Not so big if you can fly over it, but very daunting if you have to walk. Matthew says that Jesus was led into the desert by the Spirit of God, but during all this time he was tested and attacked by Satan. For forty days and nights he was without any food. In the end, Jesus was physically exhausted and hungry. Satan the tempter came to him. If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. If Jesus could not eat something now, he might die in the wilderness. Then what use would he be? It is written, said Jesus, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus had quoted a verse from the Old Testament, from the book of Deuteronomy, where God allowed the children of Israel to become hungry, but then he provided manna for them to eat. Jesus must trust in God to give him strength. Then the devil took him to the highest point in the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Jesus would not base his ministry on experimenting with God. That is not faith. Again, the devil showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. We cannot say that Jesus was not able to sin. Otherwise, the temptation was not real. But we can say Jesus was able not to sin. Jesus conquered Satan. The temptation was to take the kingdoms of the world by accepting the selfish values which Satan represented. But Jesus would not do this. His kingdom is different. The Gospel of Matthew has a very interesting structure. The story of the life of Jesus is divided into six blocks. Between them, are five blocks of teaching from Jesus. So, it's life, teaching, life, teaching, life, teaching, and so on. Let's look at that. Matthew chapters 1 through 4 starts with the life of Jesus, his birth, his baptism, and his temptation in the desert. Then chapters 5, 6, and 7 give us the Sermon on the Mount, three whole chapters on the teachings of Jesus, what we might call kingdom lifestyle. At the end of chapter 7, we read, when Jesus had finished these sayings, and the gospel moves into another section of action, this time miracles of healing in chapters 8 and 9. Then chapter 10 is teaching again this time about discipleship. Chapter 11 opens with the words, 
After Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there, and again we're back into the activity of Jesus' life and ministry. Chapter 13 is teaching through parables, seven parables in one chapter. Chapters 14 through 17 show us how Jesus responded to a series of challenges in his life. It tells us a lot about his values. Chapter 18 is more teaching, including two more parables. Chapter 19 begins with the words, when Jesus had finished these sayings, he left Galilee. What follows through chapter 22 includes both life and teaching, but is in the context of action, with Jesus traveling to Jerusalem. In chapters 23 through 25, Jesus is teaching in the temple and then continuing to teach on the Mount of Olives. The last section covers the crucifixion, the resurrection, and the command to preach the gospel in every nation. We don't have time to look at all this in detail, but we've already looked at the first section on the life of Jesus, and we can look at a few more selected passages. In that first block of teaching, in chapters 5 through 7, the famous Sermon on the Mount, Jesus tells his disciples about right attitudes towards God and towards other people, and the actions which follow. In chapter 6, he teaches them to pray. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The second block on the life of Jesus is chapters 8 and 9. It's about Jesus healing the sick around the Lake of Galilee. As part of the Roman Empire, this region had to pay port taxes. One of the tax collectors was Matthew. Because of his job, Matthew was in contact with Gentiles as well as Jews coming and going through the town. All sorts of things passed through his hands, and some of these were regarded as unclean in the Jewish religion. This contact made Matthew unclean in the eyes of his own people, contaminated by the Gentiles. He made enough money, but he must have lost his self-respect. Jesus was gathering a group of disciples, Peter the fisherman, James and John, and Jesus must have known all about the tax collector. But when Jesus came to Matthew, what he said was not expected by anyone. Follow me. To say yes and follow Jesus, Matthew must leave everything. It was a costly decision for the tax collector to become a disciple. According to Christian tradition, this was the disciple who wrote down the sayings of Jesus, which became part of the Gospel of Matthew. The third block of teaching, Matthew chapter 13, consists of parables, stories which have a meaning about the Kingdom of God. The phrase Matthew uses is Kingdom of Heaven, but it doesn't just mean the next life, it's a Jewish way of saying the Kingdom of God. I'm going to take one of these parables, which is only in Matthew's Gospel, and at the same time give you some of the cultural background which was understood by the people who heard it. The Kingdom of Heaven, said Jesus, is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. And this merchant wanted the best. This was the one. The pink pearls from the Red Sea were famous, but this was exceptional. This is what he had been searching for. But what would it cost? The price was huge. The merchant was not poor, but this pearl would cost him all he had. It seemed impossible. Perhaps the dealer would lower the price. But the dealer would not come down and the price was not unreasonable. At least the dealer might give him time to raise the money, not sell the pearl to someone else. The merchant went home. There was only one thing to do. He must sell everything. 
every object of value he possessed, beautiful things he had taken years to collect, each one of them a treasure, but they must be sold to gain the pearl. Nothing must stop him now. Some things had sentimental value to him. Yesterday he would never have parted with them. They were part of his life. But these things seemed like trinkets compared to the pearl. He knew the value of these things, and he knew the value of the pearl. There was no comparison. Beyond the thrill of the pearl itself, he knew what it was worth. And to stop now would be madness. At last, everything had gone, but the great pearl would be his. It would cost him far more than he had expected, but the pearl itself was more than he had ever imagined, and the price hardly seemed to matter. This is what he had looked for all his life, and it was worth more than he had paid. He was delighted. The great pearl belonged to him. This, said Jesus, this merchant finding a pearl is like the kingdom of heaven. It is beyond comparison. It is worth everything you have and more. In the Gospel of Matthew, there are two key verses which are turning points. They tell us to be ready for a change in the story. The first turning point is right after the temptation in the desert, Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. And so begins the public ministry of Jesus, preaching God's word and healing the sick. The second turning point comes in Caesarea Philippi, a region to the north of the Galilee and perhaps even today, the kind of place to get away and think. Jesus wanted time alone with his disciples. They talked about public opinion relating to Jesus and his ministry. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say that I am? It was Peter who spoke. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things, and that he must be killed, and on the third day be raised to life. In New Testament times, when Jewish people thought about the Messiah, the one they expected would be a great king. It's not surprising that Peter reacted. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus rebuked him. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. The path for Jesus was a difficult one, a path of sacrifice, and it would also be challenging for his disciples. Matthew had made his choice, the kingdom of God comes first. But towards the end of his gospel, we see the other side in the life and death of Judas. Judas Iscariot was one of the twelve disciples, but his values were very different from those of Jesus. When Jesus talked about the kingdom of God, Judas may have thought this was a promise of worldly power and money. And when Jesus talked about death and a cross, it probably just made no sense to him at all. He went to the chief priests and the officers of the temple. The priests in Jerusalem regarded Jesus as a threat to their own power, and they wanted to arrest him at night when no one was looking. Judas would help them, and they would pay him for his trouble. Thirty shekels of silver in return for his betrayal. As they met in Jerusalem, Jesus seemed troubled. One of you will betray me. The Son of Man will go, just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. A few hours later, Judas came to the Mount of Olives where Jesus had gone to pray. 
He knew exactly where to find him, and he greeted Jesus with a traditional kiss of friendship. Jesus was in the hands of the priests and the temple police. The high priests and the council gave their verdict. Jesus was condemned to death for claiming to be God's Messiah. The next morning, Jesus was taken to the governor, Pontius Pilate. Judea had become a province ruled by the Romans, and to them, a claim to be king was treason, punishable by crucifixion. Judas went back to the priests. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us, they replied. That's your responsibility. Matthew tells us the outcome. Judas, filled with remorse, could see only one way out. It is described in Matthew chapter 27. The terrible things that happened to Jesus were no accident. The governor's soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and set it on his head. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. Above his head was the written verdict against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. As Jesus died, something happened in the temple. The great curtain, which symbolically separated people from God, was torn in two from top to bottom. The body of Jesus was buried by Joseph of Arimathea, a member of the court who had not agreed with the verdict. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb. But in Caesarea Philippi, Jesus had also prophesied that on the third day he would rise from the dead. Again, Jesus came to his disciples and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Matthew's first chapter was looking back to the Old Testament. His last chapter is the Great Commission, looking forward to the evangelization of the world. In the genealogy in chapter 1, Matthew went out of his way to mention the names of Rahab the Canaanite and Ruth the Moabite. And when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, the wise men came from the east, from lands of the Gentiles. At the end of his book, Matthew completes the circle, and the gospel goes out from Jerusalem to all nations. The good news is that Jesus has risen from the dead. And through him, the way is open for all of us to enter the kingdom of God. You and I must make our own choice, whether, like Matthew, to follow Jesus or to go the other way. There is a cost to following Jesus Christ, but to be part of the kingdom of God, both now and in the next life, is something beyond all comparison. Good news indeed.